Hey class, tonight we're going to continue on some of our local regional factors in planting design and landscape design and focus on um, native, adaptive, and invasive species plants. I really like this quote from Walt Disney. Um, he says, I don't like formal gardens. I like wild nature. It's just the wilderness instinct in me, I guess. And so I think when you look at a place like Disney, um, where they're doing this sense of storytelling um, and really using landscape and architecture to set the stage of that story and really kind of locate the, I don't know, ride or feature you're gonna use, they really do a good job using plants to set part of that story um, and making that landscape appear endemic from wherever that location is. Um, I remember going to the Matterhorn and looking at the little wildflowers in front of it and realizing those were all California natives, but they were mimicking the effect of like a Swiss Alps type of landscape. So I think um, Walt Disney has really set a nice standard for really creating a theme in your landscape. And so if your interest and theme is native, this lecture is for you. So all of our landscape plants really come from agricultural <clears throat> origins. Um, and that is um, basically the idea that plants are raised like crops and they have become a very profitable crop. <clears throat> so in that process, that agricultural origin, many of our plants require a lot of amendments and inter intervention to maintain healthy growth. And then there's also this idea of a, an imported landscape. Um, and so as settlers start to move west or even you know, move from England to the East Coast, they have this desire to create a landscape from the place they came from. And so you see that being reflected through the use of lawns um, in both the East Coast and the West Coast. However, on the West Coast, they're maybe le they're less climate appropriate because they we need to import a lot of water to maintain those lawns. Um, but you know, this is a typical. This is in Montecito, which is a nice area close to Santa Barbara, and you can see this extensive grand lawn leading up to the house. And this is very much kind of an East Coast type of design um, applied to a West Coast climate. So we want to try and avoid that and, and maybe not create a landscape that is not so climate appropriate. And one of the ways we can do that is by incorporating some native plants into the design, or we also talked about um, Mediterranean plants that source from similar climates. Um, and so na our native plants can provide forms and, and multiple functions, include habitat opportunities. They're becoming more widely available. Um, if you're going to get the best selection, you're probably going to end up buying from a specialty nursery. But there are some nice ones in our area we'll talk about at the end. Um, we have a wide variety of different local uh, ecosystem conditions. So these native plants come from you know mountains and deserts and riparian areas and dry slopes so they're specifically adapted to our our local environment and also to the ecosystem that they are from typically our native plants have a less intensive maintenance regime and that's really in guard to adding those extra um, supplemental things like uh, a lots of water or or fertilizers or herbicides or pesticides or things like that. So a lot of our native plants can add um, beauty to the garden with many forms and colors to choose from. And a lot of times native plant landscapes benefit from including kind of structured landscape elements um, as part of the design and that can kind of help carry the design when it goes drought deciduous in summer months, if you happen to have natives that are adapted to lose their leaves and really become dry, crispy sticks to survive the summertime with no rain. 
it's not really much different than in very cold climates. You have plants that go winter deciduous and they drop all their leaves so they can survive the very cold summer months. So similar strategy, um, but it can make for a pretty barren looking landscape like this upper right hand picture. Um, if we didn't think about some structural elements to kind of keep that looking attractive in the down season. Um, so native plants have local and cultural associations with them. In certain areas of Southern California, they can be very in demand by Native American groups. Um, at Cal Poly Pomona, we actually have a native plant garden uh, that is located close to the College of Environmental Design where the Landscape Arch Architecture Department is housed. And in this region, the local Native American um, Tongva people, uh, that is how the last time I know they were wanted to be called Tongva, it might have changed recently. Um, they did not, they're not a federally designated tribe for many political reasons. Um, and so they were in real need of locations where they could collect materials for basketry and other traditional crafts and also as an educational platform where they could bring school students to learn about how they used these different uh, native plants. So sometimes we can incorporate this educational overlay in our native plant design. Um, so our native plants provide habitat for local animals um, and we can further enhance this by making sure we have the component of food, shelter, and water on a site. This draws in some of the native creatures and can help make the landscape feel alive. Um, and you can get your landscape certified by organizations like the National Wildlife Federation as our botanic garden at the campus is certified as a habitat. So again, um, specialty nurseries typically grow native plants. So that means you might have to drive a little further or spend a little bit more money to to acquire them, but sometimes worth the trip. This is actually a picture of Tree of Life Nursery up in Santa Margarita, so South Orange County, and it's um, in non-COVID times. It is open to the public uh, on weekends during the planting season, which ranges from fall to early summer. So worth maybe a trip up there if you're a native plant fan. It's quite a, a nice arrangement and they have some nice demonstration gardens up there and a really nice selection of native plants. Um, native plants typically are purchased in smaller container sizes than you would find at a normal nursery. Um, and that's because they respond better to um, replanting in a landscape when they start small they can catch up quickly. And size can be an, a, a, a tricky requirement if you're using native plants and you have um, to meet certain city or military requirements because they might require like five gallon containers. Well, native plants generally don't come in five gallon containers. They might come in four inch pots or one gallon containers. So we might have to contract grow plants to meet our clients' requirements. So we have native plants from a number of different communities. Um, and those include a coastal marsh, coastal prairie. That's actually, um, coastal prairies used to be located a little bit further north of us, uh, kind of in the Orange County, LA basin. Very, very, uh, only small remnants of these left because this was prime housing development, you know, close to the ocean, not close enough to flood, therefore it usually became houses um, but a really interesting habitat type if you come across some of the remnant fragments if you're up in the la area coastal sage grub is something that is very predominant in our area as are coastal marshes um, and as you move inland we see um, native plant communities that include chaparral um, riparian plants and oak woodland plants. And there's, of course, more. You can go up into the conifers in the mountains and uh, juniper, pinion, forests on the 
desert side of the mountains and then desert ecosystems. So those are kind of the main ones that are in the core of San Diego. A lot of our native plants are adapted to fire and other types of conditions. So we talked a lot about fire last week, but they're also adapted to stabilize slopes and for highly saline environments where we see those in the lagoons and the marshes. Um, and many of our native plants have developed water conservation strategies um, and they might conserve water by having succulent leaves that actually store the water in the leaves. They might have very, very small leaves so that they have less transpiration or plant sweat happening in those leaves. They might point the leaves straight up to minimize the surface exposed to the sun. Um, some have a higher drought threshold and can recover from drought stress, or maybe a horticultural species, if it, it's overly drought stressed, just reaches its permanent wilting point and can't recover, where a native would still be able to get water up into the system and recover from drought stress. Um, plants also shed their leaves and go in summer and go dormant. And that is mostly relevant to, I would say, our coastal sage grub community plants. The remainder usually hold their green color pretty well. Some of the desert plants have that strategy also. Um, and plants also have a kind of a symbiotic relationship with mycorrhizae. And this is a type of fungus that um, helps kind of extract more water from very arid climate soils and get that water to the plant as one, one of the functions. Um, so they can be adapted to ground steep slope conditions um, and stabilize the soil. Coastal plants have been adapted to tolerate salinity, which is usually toxic to plants. That's normally how we kill plants, is by adding salt. Um, so in Roundup, the primary ingredient is glyphosate, which is a type of salt. So that is a very unusual strategy to be uh, adapted to survive salinity. Um, and some plants are designed to burn to the ground and then only be able to reseed through a fire scarification. And those plants usually have these little fibrous starchy tubers under at their root zone. So the root stays intact and they have energy to crown sprout very quickly after a fire. So if you watch any recent burned areas, the first time there's any little moisture, those plants are back growing in full force, as long as it hasn't been burned in the recent past. Um, so many native plants have become endangered, and that is due to a number of factors. Rapid development um, and little conservation, con little regard for conservation and green infrastructure. Um, and then conversion of our wildlands through unnatural processes like fire suppression and repeated exposure to fire. So um, you might have had a chance to, to look at my project that I did last semester for a class where um, fire suppression really paid a key part in converting our local conifer eco ecosystems um, and allowed them to not recover after a fire. So many have become endangered. Um, so modern culture sometimes sees these invasive species as being a native landscape. And here's a couple examples that occur locally and people get very protective of these landscapes, yet these are not native, they are highly altered and really invasive landscapes. So the first is one that I grew up with, which is oak trees dotting kind of the golden grassy fields those golden grassy fields are really invasive European annual grasses. And if you were to actually see an oak grassland um, ecosystem that was native perennial grasses and wildflowers, it is unbelievably beautiful. 
Uh, so even though to me, this golden grassy plain is something I grew up with and I have this association and I think it's beautiful. Once I reached an understanding of what that ecosystem should have looked like if it was native, um, I, I can agree that our native system would have been 10 times as beautiful. Um, we do have some of the native ecosystems left up by the Santa Rosa Pl Plateau. That's out kind of in the Lake Paris area, um, kind of where you see all the everybody go crazy for poppies. Um, those would be similar to what the landscape should look like. Um, also are eucalyptus groves. Eucalyptus groves were planted as a measure to try and use eucalyptus as a fast growing wood for the railroads. And a lot of speculators lost their money. And because eucalyptus is from a similar Mediterranean climate in Australia, the a lot of the species reseed readily. And so you end up with these eucalyptus groves. However, those are not native to our region and they can actually be very um, damaging to some of our local e ecosystems and also very fire prone due to their high oil content. Um, invasive plants are plants which nat naturalize and reseed readily and they don't need extra water. They can threaten wildland areas top picture is Cape Ivy, a very popular plant in the, plant in the 1920s. And that's actually a view out of one of my old house's backyards. The house was built in the 20s and the entire canyon was filled with Cape Ivy. It was just it literally covering the trees. So that is considered an invasive species and it's one that we don't really use today. So when we have big conversion like the Cape Ivy or the lower picture is the um, Cortadaria, which is pampas grass, you end up with a loss of diversity and you have animals that can't really use that landscape. There's no food or forage for them in that. So you really start to push out other plants, but also the animal species. And they, do, you know, these plants don't have predators. They're not from this region. So there's nothing to really keep them in check. And that's one of the big concerns with invasive plants. So native plants need maintenance too. Um, and if you think about the processes that occur out in nature, um, they are trimmed by animals grazing. They are sensitive to watering schedules outside of their adaptive range. So with some, uh, really low water use natives that aren't used to summer water, if you start watering them in summer, they can either get diseased or die. Um, some of them we call garden friendly and they can tolerate a little bit of summer water. So do your research when planting with natives um, and make sure that you are, you know, managing their water regime in a way that um, will help their longevity. And some native species need very specific soils to grow well. And one that comes up a lot is the manzanita or arctostaphylos. Some of them that are adapted more to central coast are looking for a specialty soil, soil called a serpentine soil. Or desert species need a very well draining kind of gravelly rocky soil. Um, I know our garden tried to grow an ocotillo for years. Um, and they built a big slope and imported DG, and it was just a real struggle to, to try and grow those very, very arid climate native plants. So um, many municipalities keep invasive plant lists. I gave you an example of City of San Diego's microscopic plant list last week, um, but the best resource is really going to the California Invasive Plant Council, or Cal EPSI and they keep both their invasive plant inventory, um, the list, and then they have the watch list of plants that they suspect are invasive, um, but they are, need more documentation. And what's nice about this list is it's comprehensive, so it includes kind of the weedy things we would never find in a nursery, as well as the horticultural escapees but it, it ranks everything by region. So sometimes a plant might be invasive in Northern California, but it's not a problem in Southern California. 
So this is kind of my go-to site for researching invasive plants. And here's a few native plant resources. Um, Las Politas has a really great developed website. Um, native West Plant Nursery is located in South County. They also um, have some nice lists. And they have sales where they are open to the general public about six times a year with some really knowledgeable staff. Um, so get on their e email list if that is something of interest. Again, we talked about the Cal Epsi site. There's one not on here called Tree of Life Nursery. That's the one that's located in Santa Margarita, um, but that's another great resource. All right. Thank you, everyone.